listeners, at this time you are watching news analysis live on politics and business television. The top stories. Four stations to operate longer hours to 8 p.m. as supply, NMPC. Yahya Bello loses brief to hear 80 billion naira fraud case in Kogi. Human rights, democracy, economic growth, key issues in Samoa agreements. Minimum wage, labor urges NAS to end slave wage. Welcome back. My name is Amina Idris. Now on the news. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited says four stations are to operate longer hours for the supply and distribution of petrol, calling on four stations to aid availability given the current tight situation. The company said the turnaround period of premium motor spirit trucking is also elongated to ease the situation being witnessed. The Executive Vice President Downstream NNPC Limited, Dak Boshegun, said this on Monday in Abuja during a joint inspection of stations by the firm and the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority officials. The news agency of Nigeria reports that the NNPC and the NMDPRA embarked on a joint monitoring of the supply and distribution of four stations in the federal capital territory and across the country to ensure that queues disappear. NNPC had said that four queues in the FCT and parts of the country were a result of disruption of ship-to-ship -ship transfer of fuel between mother vessels and daughter vessels, result resulting from recent thunderstorms. Speaking during the inspection, Shagun said there was a gap in the ship to short discharge of PMS, which he described as a volatile liquid, adding that during thunderstorms, it could not be discharged, rather it had to suspend ship to shore movements. The Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, Justice John Soho, has declined the request to transfer the 80.2 billion naira fraud trial of ex-Kogi State Governor Yahya Bello from Abuja to Kogi State. The Chief Justice, in a letter dated July 2nd and signed by his special assistant, Joshua Aji, said he agreed with the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission that Bello should be tried in Abuja and not Kogi State. John Soho rejected Bello's application dated June 10, praying that his trial for alleged 8.2 billion naira fraud should be transferred to Kogi. Bello's lawyer, Adiola Adedipe, SAN, had on June 27 told the trial judge, Justice Emeka Onwite, that his client had applied to have his case transferred to Kogi. Adedipe said Bello took the decision to seek the transfer of the matter after he was briefed about what transpired at the June 13 proceedings in court. Now to the Samoa Agreement. The Samoa Agreement is a cardinal framework for European Union relations with African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. The previous partnership framework, the Cotonou Agreement, was adopted in 2000 to replace the 1975 Lomé Convention. It was concluded for a 20-year period. The Cotonou Agreement was initially due to expire in February 2020 but its provisions have been extended until the new partnership known as the Samoa Agreement between the EU and the African, Caribbean and Pacific countries provisionally applied or entered into force. The new agreement was officially signed on November 15, 2023 by the EU and its member states and the OACPS members in Samoa, an island nation located about halfway between Hawaii and New Zealand. Its provisional application started on the first day of the second month after the signature. The new partnership agreement will serve as the new legal framework for EU relations with 79 countries. This includes 48 African, 16 Caribbean, and 15 Pacific countries. The agreement aims to strengthen the capacity of the EU and the ACP countries to address global challenges together. 
It lays down common principles and covers the following six priority areas, democracy and human rights, sustainable economic growth and development, climate change and human and social development, peace and security and migration and mobility, among others. You are watching news analysis live on politics and business television. Still to come, minimum wage, labor urges NAS to end slave wage. Details of this and more after the break. Welcome back. Now to labor matters. The Nigerian Labor Congress, NLC, yesterday in Abuja asked the National Assembly to work with the Tripartite Committee on the New Minimum Wage to establish mechanisms for regular and systematic review of wage levels to ensure they keep pace with inflation and costs of living. President of NLC, Joe Ajero, made the call in a good rule message delivered at the national retreat on labor reforms and the quest for a living wage in Nigeria. The focus on legislative interventions organized by the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, NILGS, in Abuja. Ajero urged the lawmakers to review and update our labor laws to reflect the realities of today's economy and protect our people. Still, you are watching news analysis live on politics and business television. We shall be going on a quick break and when we're back, we will be joined live by our guests for today in the person of Professor Ahmed Jani Moura, Professor of Clinical Pharmacy and Pharmacy Practice at Benidorm University, Okada, Edo State. And he is also the immediate past chairman of the Governing Council of the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria, PCN, from 2020 to 2023. He will be discussing our today's topic, the outrageous increase in prices of medication. Stay tuned. Thank you for joining us. It is almost as if the hike in medications has come to stay like it is in other sectors of the Nigerian economy, as Nigerians have continued to lament the increasing prices of drugs and called for an intervention from the federal government. The issue of high cost of medications remains a pressing concern that has continued to impact their accessibility and affordability for many Nigerians. Though rooted in several factors, including economic conditions, health infrastructure limitations, and the structure of the pharmaceutical industry, the challenge has had damning repercussions for many sick patients who are already overburdened by economic policies that have overstretched resources nationwide. With millions of Nigerians suffering from diabetes, high blood pressure, depression, fever, cancer, and many others, Many of them depend on these medications whose prices have gone over the roof to survive. In one of the big pharmacies listed by NAN, augmenting 625 milligram and 1 milligram were sold for 12,300 naira and 13,300 naira respectively. As against 3,000 to 5,000, why amoxil 500 milligram is sold for 4,000 naira? Prices of many prescribed and over-the-counter medications have witnessed a steady increase, making these drugs unaffordable and unavailable. The price increase had heightened by the exit of Glamour Smithline Consumer Nigerian PLC in August 2023 and Sanofi Pharmaceutical Multinational in November 2023 from Nigeria. The escalating prices can also be attributed to a combination of factors the withdrawal of GSK, a major player in the ph pharmaceutical industry, 
and the burgeoning rate of inflation in Nigeria. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, Nigeria's inflation rate as of October 2023 stood at 27.33% and recorded to the 33.69% in 2024, the highest recorded since August 2005. And now to my guests. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. My question, my first question for you today, sir, is health, they say, is wealth. What do you think, what do you make of this rising, what do you make of this rising cost of medication? And how can the statute of paracetamol cost over 500 naira? Well, uh, thank you very much for this question. But uh, let's look at it in perspective. In the first place, um, pharmacy is a healthcare profession. And there are about um, 14 healthcare professions in this country that are being regulated by one regulatory agency or the other. In the case of pharmacy, it's being regulated by the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria. You have the Medical and Dental Council, Nursing Medical Council, and so on and so on. But of all this healthcare professions, it is only in pharmacy is a profession. It's only the pharmacist who produces an item, which are normally called three-dimensional of high intrinsic value, which has prophylactic, curative, and diagnostic value. The pharmacist manufactures pharmaceutical product, which we call drug, or in the hospital extemporaneously mixes the product no other healthcare professional does the same so there is both the curative diagnostic and prophylactic component of pharmaceutical products and the commercial aspect of it that is why prices every pharmaceutical product wears a label a price these pharmaceutical products are not just products as in one product thing. No. A pharmaceutical product is a combination of so many factors, so many chemicals and other additives, which makes it what it is. And these are all taught to the students in the universities, and they perfect it as professions. So this is very important. Now, there are two sources of pharmaceutical products in any nation including Nigeria. Products manufactured locally, which we call local, local pharmaceutical industries, and those that are imported into the country. No nation produces 100% of all its medication, including the advanced countries. Now, we produce about 30 to 40% of the drugs that we need in our primary health centers, secondary healthcare facility providers, that is general hospital and the tertiary healthcare provider facilities. Okay. Now, of that 30% that are produced, everything, every component which we call active pharmaceutical ingredients and excipients are imported into the country, except for water, sugar, and some other things. Whereas for the, those that are imported, of course, as the name includes, they are imported 100%. And you need foreign exchange for that. But recently, the federal government exempted small and medium enterprises, manufacturing and pharmaceutical companies from VAT. Would this change anything? And isn't it coming too little too late, considering the exodus of big pharmaceutical companies from the country? Well, it is not too little too late. Uh, anything that the federal government can do to alleviate the challenges being faced, especially in terms of pricing, is welcome. Pharmaceutical manufacturing, pharmaceutical profession, pharmacy profession, the regulation started in 1927. That's about 97 years ago, or there are about. Over time, the dispensing of pharmaceutical products in the hospitals were free, including when I graduated from the university, all the medications were given free to everybody. But with population explosion, naturally, and the decline in uh, revenues it gets to a point that you cannot get all the drugs under one roof i'm talking to you from the days of dispensers when you dispense when you mix the medication 
in the dispensary. That's what they call dispensers. From 1900 to 1927 to early 19, 1950s, when you started having the manufacturing per se by the likes of Glaxo, Me and Baker, and Pfizer in the country. Up to the early 70s, when you have indigenous pharmaceutical manufacturing companies making, you know, Nigerians producing, and so not multinationals per se. Now, this went on until 1989. 1989 is a turning point during the regime of former President Ibrahim Badabasi Babangida, who introduced the Drugs Revolving Fund. It's a fund whereby every state at that time was given one million era to procure pharmaceutical products so that it's a seed which will now germinate. The essence was to have every drug under one roof because most times that you're in a prescription you find that out of maybe five you can only have two or three in the in the pharmacy every local government was given one hundred thousand to procure pharmaceutical products this scheme is still ongoing in this country the drugs revolving fund scheme you buy the drugs you mark up below what is obtained in the private pharmacies and you sell to the patients in the hospital setting that was the first time medications we are now charged by price in hospitals. Before that time, they are all given free, including expensive antibiotics, antineoplastics, and so on. From the days of the drugs we found up to now, we now have the National Health Insurance Authority. And again, drugs are charged at 10% of their cost. So these are all government policies over time to ensure that there is some kind of uh, succor for the patients and users of pharmaceutical products so the back to your question the vat thing that has been mentioned by the federal government is a welcome thing whether it is late or it's not late it's still a welcome thing what you are looking at like i said to you earlier on the totality of pharmaceutical products does not only start start and finish with the active pharmaceutical ingredient you have the packaging materials you have the labeling materials isn't it and you have the input you have to pay for the salaries of the workers, the pharmaceutical representatives that go out to deliver these things along the distribution chain. So do you agree that this hike in price will have grave implications on the lives of Nigerians? I mean, due to the increase in the price, maybe those that have diabetes, those that have fever will now try to go back to local drugs. Well, it has always been the case. I mean, uh, even before the hike of drugs, the pharmaceutical, the orthodox pharmaceutical industry was competing, quote-unquote, with local hubs, babalawas, prayer houses. You understand, with all due respect, is the issue that um, we are scientists and we look at the scientific component of what, what a pharmaceutical product can do so that you replicate it. There has to be a clinical trial, which means that over and over, it's a global thing all over the world. If a, if, a, if a product is produced in Australia, you should be able to pass the test in Canada, for instance. If a drug is produced in China, in Chile, you should be able to uh, give relief to those that sort it. So, the issue has always been there because of the disparity, and parity in terms of income. How many people have the disposable income to buy these drugs, even when we are not in this situation? Even before, people could, some people could not afford it. Some people could afford, say, uh, antibiotics to say, let me buy two or four, or four capsules. It doesn't work that way. So the issue that I'm talking about now is for the government to deliberately, as a matter of policy, ensure the availability of pharmaceutical products in all health care provider facilities that can be accessed by the patients in this country. The same way, we are not talking about fuel. The federal government opened NNPC depots. It wasn't there before. It was deregulated. It was free for all, only in the private sector. We have silos for agricultural products, isn't it? Maize, sorghum, cassava, and so on. So in the same way, I would advocate that the federal government should build giant pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities in each of the geopolitical zones so that they produce generic products so that anybody accessing anybody going any patient going to government hospital for instance should be able to um, 
be dispensed these medications at a lower rate. There must be some kind of rebate because health is wealth. Exactly. So who exactly do you think should be blamed for this? Is it the government or the pharmaceutical society? Who should be blamed for this? No, no, no. It's, it's not a question of uh, blaming anybody. It's a question of the reality of the times. The times have come, one, because of the fact that we don't have active pharmaceutical ingredients. We import them. We have to produce them. And there have been moves, actually. I recall what, like last year when I was the chairman of the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria, there is a, a body in America, Nigerian Association of Pharmacists and Pharmaceutical Scientists in the Americas. We plan for a conference so that we can now harness and look at the areas of um, producing active pharmaceutical ingredients and excipients. Like, for instance, the paracetamol that I'm talking about, a large chunk of it is from starch. There is starch component to make it bulk and handled properly. So we have starch in maize, we have starch in cassava, we have starch in uh, potato, we have starch in, in uh, yams. So the issue is how do you now process this starch into pharmaceutical grade starch that you can now use in pharmaceutical products. You have stearic acid, you have gelatin, you have talc, you have all these things that is in addition to the active pharmaceutical ingredient that you need for. We start from there. So it's an issue of policy. There's a National Institute for Pharmaceutical Research and Development. It's also working around that direction. So, again, the times have come for the government to take it, to take the horn, to take the bull by the horn, to address the issue. We are talking about 220 million people. When I talk to you about uh, the extemporaneous population when drugs were given free, what was the population of Nigeria? 57 million, 60 million, below 100 million. But now you can't do that. So, it's actually the government of the day should address the issue in the best interest of the patients in this country. Of course, we have fewer hospitals then, but now we have more hospitals. We have general hospitals by the state governments. We have teacher hospitals by the federal government and federal medical centers, and we have other specialist hospitals. They all depend on drugs, and these are public health institutions. So it is the responsibility of the government to also augment by producing, say, generic drugs to ensure that all patients visiting these hospitals get 100% of the drugs on their prescription. So now the government aside, what is the pharmaceutical council and so other stakeholders like your very good self doing to cope this situation? No, the pharmaceutical council is a regulatory body. It is a government regulatory body which was uh, established through a decree now act um, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria of 2022 signed into law by Mr. President. It is responsible for the regulation and control of pharmacy education and practice. We are talking about the practice of pharmaceutical There is manufacturing, practice of pharmacy, there are four of them. Manufacturing of pharmaceutical products, there is wholesale, there is hospital pharmacy, and there is the retail pharmacy. So, the regulatory body regulates how the practice takes place. Do you understand? That's why we do this thing to curb the incidences of fake drugs, substandard drugs, and so on. Now, it has always been private sector driven. Yes, at 2021, end of 2021 or 2022, we had about 190 pharmaceutical manufacturing companies. All of them are owned by the private sector, except for some few cases where some state governments have their own pharmaceutical manufacturing facility, like Kano State. You understand? I established a pharmaceutical manufacturing facility in Kaduna State, my state, when I was inside it. But now it's no longer operational. So, but these are the things that the government has to do deliberately. Are you with me? Yes, sir. So now let's bring in the government. What kind of quick intervention should the government practice to save the health of Nigeria? Like what, what can they do quickly? Because I think the Nigerian health sector is deteriorating. Quickly, can say in terms that. of pharmaceutical products. I mean, yes, yes. Quickly, I would say. The duty on packaging materials, labeling materials, the duty on active pharmaceutical ingredients should be reduced. 
if not all to be not good. Secondly, there should be to me a healthier bank, a bank that pharmaceutical manufacturers should access at single digit interest rate and with a long moratorium so that pharmaceutical manufacturers and importers should not be able to access these loans produce to the interest of the healthcare delivery system in this country. Anything short of that will not work. There must be, you have your in business, you have to access loans in the banks. You have to import machinery and equipment. Energy is there. Diesel. You have to ensure, you have to have your own water, unfortunately. And all these things need money. So you need to go to the banks and get these uh, loans so to service the industry. And uh, you cannot do that with 33%, sorry, with 25% interest rate. You can't do it. So aside loans, there's nothing they can do to just bring down the costs of this drug production. Because even if they're putting the loan laws, I'm very sure not most, most Nigerians will not be able to assess well, I've said it earlier on. I said I, I'm looking at the situation whereby the federal government should have, should establish pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities, at least big ones in each of the geopolitical zones, to produce as many paracetamol tablets as possible, as many folic acid as possible, as many as possible at a reduced rate. So, so some kind of intervention there, quick jack intervention. So with that kind of thing, now it has intervened. But I mean, you don't develop pharmaceutical manufacturing industry overnight. If they start today, in the next 24, in the 24 months, they can have it. In each geopolitical zone, northwest, northeast, north central, north, south, 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 west, and south is going at the same time. Do you understand? With what you have in the private sector, just like the NAPC depot. NAPC is government. They are producing, they are, they are selling fuel at reduced price. And at the same time, you also have the private sector downstream selling in their own uh, filling stations. So, which one, whichever one you want, you go there. But essentially, this government owned pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities about to will 100% be supplying these pharmaceutical products to basic ones. They can't produce all to the government hospital, to the public hospitals. It's done. It's done all over the country, all over the world. You don't just allow it to float like that. Businessmen will always exploit it. And there has been Mr. Um, professor Ahmed Tijani Mura, Professor of Clinical Pharmacy and Pharmacy Practice at Venetian University, Okada, Edo State. And also the immediate past chairman of the Governing Council of the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria, PCN, 2020-2023. And that will be the size of the program for today. Thank you for staying tuned. I'll be back shortly with the news updates. I am Idris Amina.